We're starting an Advent series today we call From Heaven Above, and the whole series will be based on a verse, on a, actually a Christmas prophecy in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah is a guy in the Old Testament, a prophet, who had a word about this birth of Jesus, uh, this baby boy who would be born in Bethlehem, and he kind of prophesied this hundreds of years earlier. Let me just read this verse from you, uh, to you on the screen here. Isaiah 9, uh, verse 6, it says, For to us a child is born. To us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And then it says, and he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. These four names or these four titles given to Jesus already hundreds of years before he was born, uh, we want to look at these titles over, the, over this Advent season and ask ourselves this question, what does it mean for Jesus to be those to us? You interested? Yeah? Today we're going to look at what does it mean for Jesus to be a wonderful counselor to us? I actually want to start um, this way. How many of you ever get the impression that we live in a world where it's hard to find the truth? As if you're constantly being lied to online and offline, okay, with fake news and alternative facts and... Um, And, and even Instagram filters and like, she doesn't normally look as good as this. Like, <laughs> like you know, it's like all the time, it's like, wow, if everything seems fake in this world, you know, and, and we, we long for truth, but it seems like everything's become really uh, untrue. And uh, how many of you like this? <laughs> Nobody, right? We, we all hate it, yet that's kind of the world in which we live. And so we tell our children even like that they shouldn't lie, right? We tell them at the same time, like a moment later, We lie to them when we say how pretty this painting is that they just created. It's like, oh, this looks really good, darling. It doesn't, you know. Some of you, like, you, you look at it like, like when, I, when I have children, I will never lie to my children. How many of you parents actually have lied to? Can I just, is it just me? Don't look at me as if it's just me, right? Sometimes you just kind of twist the truth a little bit with them. I've actually, I have here on, on the screen my top 10 list of parenting lies. They're not all, fr I, I may not all have shared them with my kids, maybe, maybe not, but here they are, just so we get into the subject. So number 10, this chocolate has alcohol in it. <laughs> you can't eat this, you won't like it, yeah? Sorry, it's not for you. <laughs> I've definitely used that one. Okay, we'll come back to the playground later, yeah? How many of you said this? And then the ch kids go to sleep in the evening, uh, half asleep already. Hold on, we didn't go back to the playground. And, uh. Okay, number eight. If you eat carrots, you'll be able to see in the dark. How many, you have parents who said this to you? Anybody? No? Okay. Number seven. <laughs> That animal over there by the side of the road is just taking a nap. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Number six. Uh, is Burger King is only for royalty. We can't go there ever. This is only for royalty. Some of you are looking at me as if I'm this terrible parent. Like, I tell you, one day some of you will have kids. This is your useful list. You should take a picture of this when we're done down the list, okay? I, I promise. Number five uh, is, just tell me the truth. I promise I won't get upset. How many of you had a parent said this to you and then they still got upset after this? It was a lie. They lied to you. Number four is, uh, yes, we are all going to bed at 7, 8, uh, 7 p.m. Of course that's not true, right? Number three is, uh, if you don't hurry to get out of the bathtub, you go down the drain with the water, <laughs> right? That's a parenting lie. Like, how many of you were scared of the drain in the bathtub when you were just me? Okay, uh, let's move on quickly. It's embarrassing. Number two, they don't sell replacement batteries for that toy. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, I really would buy them. <laughs> And number one, just because it's Christmas time almost, we use a lot of lies, don't we? Like, if we don't clean your room, Santa will give the Nintendo to somebody else. Right? It's perfect. There's so much pressure you can put on kids with Christmas. <laughs> hey, uh, but seriously, why is it that we, even in our homes, we, we tend to be not truthful all the times? Like, we live in a world with so much alternative facts and, and just fairy tales all over. And why is that? What is it doing to us? And how do we break free from that? That's what I want to look at with you today. Um, and hopefully you'll see the connection of why we need 
a wonderful counselor. I want to look at you today, uh, with you today, with, uh, with in a scripture in John chapter 8. If you have your Bibles or your little message notes in your contact cards, you can open them up. In John chapter 8, Jesus is talking with a group of Pharisees. Those were kind of the religious elite at the time. And they're having a bit of a theological debate. Okay? Let me just read this to you. And uh, hopefully by the end of this, it'll all make sense. Jesus said to them, we're in verse 31. Jesus said to them, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teaching. So that's the mark of a Jesus follower is that he's faithful or she's faithful to his teachings. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. What? How does that work? That truth actually sets us free from something? I hope we can answer this question today. But then they said, uh, we are descendants of Abraham. We've never been slaves to anyone. Like, hello, have you not paid attention to your people's history? Like you were enslaved in Egypt, right? That's the big thing you celebrate with the Exodus and all that. Like clearly uh, they have forgotten about this. And then they said, well, our father is Abraham. No, Jesus replied. But if you were really the children of Abraham, you would follow his example. So Abraham was this Old Testament hero of the faith. And he said, you should follow his example. Instead, you are trying to kill me because I told you the truth which I have heard from God. Abraham never did such a thing. No, you are doing the works of your own father. Dun, 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 da. Like, what is he saying here, right? Now, this next sentence, uh, I need to explain it. They replied, we aren't illeg illegitimate children. They are having a, a bit of a, a go at Jesus here because, you know, at, at Christmas, we celebrate the virgin birth of Jesus, that Jesus had a biological mother and Joseph was the adoptive father, right? And it was, it was a miracle, a virgin birth, and they didn't believe that story. And so they made up stories about Jesus, of how he was an illegitimate, he was born illegitimately. Actually, what this translation here literally says, this is a very sanitized translation. Most of your Bibles will have a sanitized translation here. In the Greek, it says, we are not bastards like you. Can I say that in church? <laughs> I just did. I guess it happens, yeah. It, it, you know, that's how, like, shots fired at Jesus, right? This, is, this isn't just a friendly exchange here. They are in a heat, heated, heated debate. And they say, no, we're not bastards like you. God himself is our true father. And Jesus told them, if God were your father, you would love me because I have come to you from God. You are the children of your father, the devil. He's firing back like shots fired again, right? And you love to do the evil things he does. He, the devil, he was a murderer from the beginning. He has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Right? I know you're looking at me like, come on, it's the first of Advent. Why do we have this as an Advent text? Like, bear with me a little bit. Jesus, in this heated exchange, he gets right to the heart of the matter. And he's talking about the reality of evil in this world in which we live that is so full of lies. In fact, he gives them three facts that I can see in this text from what he says. If you, if you want to, you can write them down. Fact number one is the devil is real. The devil is real. He says he's been around since the beginning. He's always been there. Like he, he is, it's real guys. And I know some of you, you are thinking, ah, this is a bit like, uh, it's a bit pr pr uh, primitive to think this is a bit naive. Like who still believes in the devil? Like kind of this is just trying to scare me or something. Uh, Jesus says, don't be fooled. Don't be fooled. Maybe the greatest trick that the enemy has ever pulled is that he convinced us that he doesn't exist. Jesus says, don't be fooled. The devil is real and he is um, he's smart, he's clever, and he's crafty, and he's powerful. In other places, Jesus refers to the devil as the prince of this world. In other words, he's saying the devil is a ruler in this world. He has influence, he has might in this world. First thing. Fact number two. He says, uh, his ambition is death. Uh, he's saying, I know it's so, ad so Christmassy today, right? His ambition is death. Uh, he's saying, like, he's, he's been a murderer from the beginning. 
In other places in the Bible, it says he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Maybe you've been around churches for a while, or maybe you've been at a Christian concert or something, and somebody on stage said this, God loves you, and he has a wonderful plan for your life, right? That's true. You can also say, the devil hates you, and he has a vicious plan for your death. The devil hates you. When you become a Christian, you get God as your father, yes, but you also get the enemy, get the, dev get the devil as your, as your enemy. And the third thing, the third fact you can write down is his weapon is lies. His weapon is lies. He says when he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and he is the father of lies. That means he's very good at it. He's very good at lying. Uh, we need to maybe reframe the way we think about what we call spiritual warfare or spiritual attacks. Because some of us, we think, oh, a spiritual attack is when maybe there's a monster climbing out from under your bed and twisting your arm or something. Or you're maybe having a seizure or something. That's a spiritual attack. Like these things might happen. I don't know. But what if spiritual attacks actually are in here? What if it's, what if it's about the lies that you are being told all the time? Like, think about the Garden of Eden. When Eve was, um, uh, yeah, when the enemy came and he convinced Eve that she should disobey God and by doing that, destroy humanity. Right? I mean, that's a story in itself, right? But when you, when you look at that story, he didn't have to put a gun to her head. He put an idea in her head. Right? It, it was all about a lie. Did God really say you shouldn't? You know, like questioning God, and that's how it all started. That how every temptation, every sin, it all starts in here. And that's why Jesus, in verse 32, he comes and he says, you need to know the truth, because the truth will actually set you free. That's what he says. You will know the truth, and truth will set you free. What does that mean? The truth will set you free when you've been enslaved by a lie. That's when you need to know the truth, because you've been enslaved by a lie. Now, some of you are looking at me a bit blank, so let me try to explain it. A while ago, I saw on, I think on Instagram or somewhere on the internet, I saw this picture right here on the screen of a horse that is being uh, tied to a plastic chair. <laughs> and the line underneath was, uh, what is holding you back? <laughs> uh, and I had to, like, this is... Is this real? Like, this, is, this looks really funny. Like, this, this horse is obviously much stronger than the chair. It could just run off, but apparently it's standing still. And I had to check with uh, Mary Schmidt from our church, who knows all about horses. And because I know, like, yeah, horses, they are uh, very friendly animals, but they're not stupid, you know. <laughs> but I had to check with her, and she confirmed that this is actually true. A well-trained horse would have been tied to a tree or a post or a wall so often in its lifetime that it just knows, hey, when I'm tied to something, I can't move. And therefore, I'm supposed to stand still. It's just, that's how it's trained, okay? And um, she even said, like, you, you don't even have to tie the horse to anything. As there are some horses, when, it, when they just kind of feel the little thing, the nose band, and they see the, 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 what, the reins, that's when they know we have to, we're supposed to stand still. Just because, oh, the lanes are somewhere here. I'm supposed to stand still. So the, the, the horse could move, but the only reason why the horse is not moving is because of a false belief. And some of you, can I just say this? Some of you, you are stuck. You are not moving because of a false belief. Some of you, you are in a prison, and the lock on that prison door is a lie you believed. Let me invite you um, a little bit. Let me get vulnerable. Let me invite you into my thought life uh, and show you my crazy. Because <laughs> it's weird in here. I promise it's weird. <laughs> uh, I hope that's okay with you. Just to, to, to hopefully this, as you start to think about it, it will start to make sense. So when I think about my life and I think about um, my calling in my life, not just for ministry, but even my calling to be a husband, my calling to be a dad, like I get overwhelmed very quickly. And I have what I call two thoughts. You know, two thoughts are, I am too insecure. I care so much. I'm haunted by what other people think about me. Like, and like, I have these two thoughts. If only, if only I wouldn't be this insecure, I could. You know? Or I'm too stubborn. 
Oh, if I only were a bit more open-minded, it would be just much easier for me and everybody else. I'm so stubborn at times, right, Jenny? Yeah. <laughs> she's, she's nodding. <laughs> uh, I'm so stubborn at times. If I, if I wouldn't be this stubborn, I could, but because I am, I can't, right? Or I have these thoughts of, I am too messed up. If the people in this room would know what I sometimes think about them, Ooh, hoo, hoo. you know, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm too messed up. The thoughts that come to my head, it's just like, oh, I don't, I'm so disqualified because of what's in here, yeah? So I have these two thoughts, and I also have enough thoughts, like I am not clever enough, or I am not, uh, I'm not praying enough, I'm not disciplined enough, I'm not godly enough. For the first year here in this church, I'm not Neville enough. That was a big one for me, right? Um, these two thoughts and these enough thoughts. How, how many of you, is this just me or any of you else familiar? With, just raise your hand. Come on, be, be honest. Leave the hand up just for a moment and look around for those who are not raising their hands. And let's pray for their pride <laughs> right now. They need deliverance. Okay. They're living in a lie for sure. <laughs> right? Listen, I, 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 I sometimes, I get to rub shoulders with, with just people who you think like, wow, they're just at the top of their game, like a, an artist or a, an athlete or someone in the business or even the pastor of a very big church. It's like, okay, they, and you know what I found? Everybody's having these thoughts. Even people at the top of their game are having these thoughts. Um, the greatest mistake you can make with your life is assuming that everything you think is true. Greatest mistake you can make with your life or in your life is assuming that everything that's in here is actually true. Jesus says um, that our thoughts and these deceptions, they can actually tie us. They can, he talks about slavery. They can enslave us. It is possible to be in a prison and the prison lock is a lie you have believed. It is it's possible for a lie to get its foot in the door. It's a foothold. And that foothold becomes a stronghold. It just gets big. It ex a stronghold is anything in your mind that exalts itself. Okay? It just gets bigger than it's supposed to be. Let me explain this because some of you are still looking at me blank. So, some of you, maybe, like just, okay, I'll try. So, imagine this is your life lane, right? And you have a, a dream, a purpose, a calling, a vision, ideas of what you want to do with your life. But maybe you just became a parent. Maybe you are now a mom and you love your child, but you realize, wow, everything I wanted to do with my life now has to take a step to the side because I'm caring for this child that never sleeps, <gasps> you know? Or maybe you have uh, turned a year older or maybe you are now over 50 or 60 and you realize, huh, my, like m most of my life is already over. Like I'm looking at lots of young people, but at some point this will actually hit you and then you will think, Maybe I have missed my chance because of my age, because of my family, my baby. I have missed my chance. I won't be able to, f to pursue this dream anymore. And this foothold, this lie that came into your mind becomes a stronghold because you keep repeating it like a broken record and it becomes a stronghold. And suddenly there's almost like a, a wall, like a prison bar in front of that lane of your life when you can't move any further. Does make sense? How about your friendships? <coughs> You have great friends in your life, but you're also thinking what I just said, like, hey, if these people would really know this side of me, they would reject me. They would quit my, this friendship and I wouldn't be their friend anymore. So what you're doing is you're hiding one or two percent of your life and you're just kind of showing everything else. You're always going like, come on, but you keep people at a distance, right? And uh, if you... <laughs> If you are only 99% known, you are 100% unknown. You know this. People can't love all of you. Like you think, oh, if people wouldn't know this about me, they wouldn't love me. Actually, the truth is, until people would, will know this about you, they can't love you for who you really are because you're putting on a game, a facade. Right? But this lie that you have, it, this foothold becomes a stronghold and it builds itself up, it exalts itself in your mind and suddenly there's another, another like prison bar right in front of you and you're not making any progress in your relationships. How about your dating relationships? 
right? Some of you are in the game still to find a date, maybe a husband, a, a wife at some point, and you're like, come on, this is, this is for me now. Dave, preach. <laughs> some of you, you uh, maybe there's something that happened in your story, maybe years ago, where somebody didn't treat you right. And you actually, you have this thought in your head that this, like it repeats itself like a soundtrack, a broken record, that you think, because of this, I am worthless. Because of this, I am trash. And the problem is you're only dating people who treat you like trash because of this lie. It's like you're manipulating yourself almost. You're sabotaging yourself because of this lie that you've allowed in your mind, this foothold became a stronghold and now there's a prison bar in front of your dating relationships. Some of you have that in your relationships with God. That maybe you've been in a church where there was a very, like, very judgmental kind of preaching and you think God is disgusted with me, God is annoyed with me, God is disappointed with me, he will never want to talk to me, he will never want to listen to my prayers. He will never want to listen to my worship. And this stronghold, because foothold became a stronghold, is like another, and you see after a while, you end up in a prison full of lies. And that's why Jesus came and says, you need to be set free from these lies. You need to know the truth because we'll unlock all these prison doors that you have created around yourself. That's why Jesus says, I have come to be a wonderful counselor, to lead you into the truth to show you the truth of who you really are in my eyes and how much I love you. And all of this, that's, that's why Jesus came to be a wonderful counselor. Have you ever thought about why Jesus uh, kind of showed up and he uh, introduced himself as a rabbi, as a teacher, right? He didn't come as some people would have hoped for the Messiah to come like as a strong warrior or as a skillful mus uh, uh, politician or maybe even uh, a, a charming celebrity. That's not how he came. He came as a rabbi because what we need when you're enslaved by lies is a wonderful counselor who sets us free. Now, how do we experience Jesus as a wonderful counselor who sets us free from these prison bars that we have? Uh, he actually says it in the very first verse. He says, remain in my word, remain in my teachings. Where do we find his teachings? In this book. Guys, this isn't very complicated. This is actually a very simple message today, right? If you want to know Jesus as the wonderful counselor, if you want to be set free from the lies that keep exalting themselves in your mind, you need to get your face in this book. <laughs> Facebook joke, almost, but no. <laughs> you, need to, you need to get into this, this book, okay? And uh, before we kind of wrap up here, I just want to give you... Uh, very quickly, three practical ways of how, how we can do this. You can write these down. The first thing is make the Bible your compass. Make the Bible your compass. Make it, make it kind of your, your benchmark. Let Jesus counsel you through his word. Can I say something? I hope I don't offend you with this, but some of you, you are in a spot in your life where you refuse to believe anything you don't like. True, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> There's, and just because you don't like something doesn't mean it's not true. Like when I, I know it's not even Christmas yet, but when I stand on a scale <laughs> to, yes, to, to know how, how heavy I am. Like there's two things that happen. I look down, I see a number, and there's two things that happen. Number one, I don't like it. Number two, it's still true, right? Just because you don't like something doesn't mean it's not true. Some of you have a relationship with the Bible like I have to my scale. Like, oh, I don't like what it says, but it's still true, okay? Maybe you look, I don't like what it says in this book about uh, having to forgive those who have wronged me. I don't like this, but it's still true. I don't like what it says in this book about generosity and giving my money away and giving my time away and coming early on a Sunday maybe to set up chairs. I don't like this. It's true. I don't like what it says in this book that God's idea for sex is that it's supposed to be in marriage. One man, one woman. Whoa, I don't know who believes that. I don't like this. It's still true. It says it in this book. I don't like what it says in this book about racism 
and uh, welcoming the stranger as a friend. I don't like, it's still true. I don't like what it says in this book about creation care and caring for this, in, this planet that is like, you know, we actually should do something. I don't like, it's still true. Do you see what I mean? Like, make the Bible your uh, compass. I want to show you a verse in 2 Corinthians. It got really quiet in here for a moment. Uh, 2 Corinthians 10. It says, we demolish arguments, the lies, and every pretension, that's the deceptions, that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. It's almost as a battle between arguments and knowledge of God. And then he says, we take captive, listen to this language, after everything we just talked about. We take captive everything, like every thought to make it obedient to Christ. What is he saying? What is Paul saying? He's saying flip the, ca flip the captivity. Flip the, that's hard to say. Flip the captivity, like you have been enchained by these lies, you have been bound by these lies, now it's time for you to change the game and you take them captive. In other words, I think what he's saying is you treat lies like a spy. You've seen action movies and, and drama movies and where there's maybe a spy in the camp, like somebody who's like a mole, like somebody who's on the inside, but he's actually working for the outside. Somebody who you think they're on your side, but they're actually working for the enemy, right? At some point then that is revealed and what they do in the movies, maybe in real life as well, they sit down this spy, they put a, a light into his face like these lights I know I face right now, right? And, and they sit him down and then they interrogate him and they say, well, who sent you? Who are you working for? <laughs> right? Why are you here? Who, who sent you? That's, that's, and Paul is saying that's what you should do with every thought that comes to your mind. You should interrogate it like a mole, like a spy. That you sit down, every thought in your head is like, who sent you? Why are you here? Who are you working for? And when you have the Bible as your compass, as your benchmark, it will actually help you to authenticate the truthfulness of the thoughts that are in your head. Make sense? Number two, uh, another tip here, not just make the Bible your compass, but uh, make the Bible an encounter. Make the Bible an encounter. This book right here, guys, is, is so different to any other book you will ever read. It's, it's not a, an academic book, although there's knowledge in here. It's not a history book, although there's history in here. It's not a psychology book, although there's stuff about psychology in here even. Right? It's not a rule book, although there are some rules in here as well. First and foremost, this right here is the living Word of God through which you can personally encounter the wonderful Counselor. When you open this book, these words, they become alive. They pierce your heart. Like they speak to you. It gets that personal. And then you have an encounter. You meet with the author of this book when you start reading, right? Maybe you want to write down this sentence here on the screen. Every time I pick up my Bible, I open up my Bible, I am one Holy Spirit breath away from a fresh encounter with a living God. Every time you do that, every time you open up your Bible, one Holy Spirit, and then there it is. Oh, this isn't just a book. It's a person that is revealed here. Wonderful counselor, you have a fresh encounter with the living God. God says about this word that it is like a fire, it is like a sword, it is like a hammer, it is like milk, it is like a seed, it is like, a, it is like a, what does he say, a mirror, it, it is like a light, right? In other words, it's full of life, it's full of power, it's full of movement, it's full of energy, it's full of himself, really. Okay, it's full of himself. So make the Bible an encounter where you expect to meet with God. And then number three um, is uh, make the Bible a habit. Make the Bible a habit. And if you're like me, this one's not easy. You struggle with this just like I do every day to get into this word. Um, but uh, it's always worth it, isn't it? Um, let me try to land this message uh, with, with this little story. Uh, so how many of you at home, you have a little nativity set with little um, figures, some of you? Don't have to be embarrassed about it. You can, you can yeah? Okay, so three people. Have, the, <laughs> have you set it up already? 
in your home. No, not yet, okay. All right, so but you've seen those nativity sets where you're basically trying to remember the Christmas story with these little wooden or plastic or Playmobil or whatever, right? <laughs> Just set up. And there's always like these three strange characters, these three dudes who bring, who bring presents, right? The, 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 they're called the Magi from the East. And it's so bizarre, isn't it? It's so random. Like, what are they doing there? They don't really fit in this. Like, it's all peasants and, and shepherds and, and all of that. It just looks really simple. And now there's these people with really fancy clothes and they show up and they bring gold, frankincense and myrrh, whatever these three things are. I know what gold is, but I don't, whatever this really is. And by the way, this is why we do Christmas gifts because of their gifts. So we should be grateful for them as well. <laughs> uh, but they show up and they actually, it says they, they bowed down before Jesus and they said, this is the king of the Jews. And they brought these gifts and it says they worshiped him. And Bible scholars are looking at this and they're like, this is so weird, like so random. Who are they? They're, they're never mentioned again. Like what is the whole purpose of their presence there? It's just so mysterious to us. And, And it's a bit hard to explain. Well, the only other place in the Bible where Magi are mentioned is in the book of Daniel. Maybe you've heard about the book of Daniel. It's in the Old Testament. There was a guy named Daniel. The book's <laughs> named after him. And he was a Jewish man who was very religious, very, very devout Jewish, Jewish man, knew the scriptures, a man of prayer. The Holy Spirit was on him. He was very gifted by the Holy Spirit as well. And he lived not at home, but he lived in exile in Babylon. Okay? Uh, from the east, <laughs> in the east of Bethlehem. That's where he lived. And he, he served in the royal household. And... Uh, Because he was so, so gifted by the Holy Spirit, a, a, the king very quickly recognized there's something special about this Daniel. He was able to interpret dreams. He was able to, to know about kind of stars and, and things like, you know, and, 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 and he was just very, there was lots of wisdom in this man. And, and the king recognized this. And, and in Daniel chapter four, we read that the king appointed Daniel to be the chief of the Magi. And what Daniel began to do is he began to teach the other Magi, he became their teacher. He began to teach them about all of the Jewish prophecies about this coming Messiah, this king who would come, who would uh, establish a kingdom that would never end. This king who would come with a new vision for life that was unheard of. This king who would be the savior of the world. And he taught them all about the prophecies from Isaiah. Then in Daniel chapter 9, he actually gets his own prophecy that he shares with them. It's very exciting. At some point, Daniel died, but we know that the Magi, they must have been very diligent with kind of keeping to their scriptures, keeping to their knowledge. It was a family thing. If you were a Magi, then your son became a Magi, your grandson became a Magi. And I guess what happened is that the, the Magi that were taught by Daniel passed on these prophecies that Daniel was sharing with them about the coming Messiah. They passed it on to their sons and to their grandsons and to the sons of their grandsons. And for 600 years, these random, strange, mysterious magi in Babylon were studying the teachings of their chief, their master magi, Daniel, and all the other prophecies he brought to them. And then 600 years later, they saw that star and they must have thought somehow, oh, this is the sign. Let's go now. Let's follow this star. And then they came and they arrived in Bethlehem and then they knelt in front of the baby Jesus. And they said, this is the king. We've heard about this. We've been waiting for 600 years. Here he is. And they brought their gifts and they worshiped him. Now, some of you, I hope some of you will make a decision today to make the Bible a habit, to like get consistent with studying these scriptures, to receive counsel from the wonderful counselor through this book. And I want to tell you this decision could change the next 600 years of your family history. Think about this, for 600 years, like at some point, the king will return. We believe this as Christians, right? Jesus will come back one day. And what if because you've been serious about this book and you've passed it on to the generations after you, to your children, to your grandchildren, 
What if whenever, the, whenever it is, when the, maybe hundreds of years from now, maybe tomorrow, I don't know, but whenever the king comes back, what if there are people that have your last name and, and they also knew about the prophecies and they also knew about this wonderful council and they know about him and when he comes in glory, they run towards him and they greet him, and they fall on their knees and they worship him. I've been waiting for you. I want to pray for you guys. Uh, I want to pray for us as a church. That we will be a church that get this serious, continues to be serious about his word, his teachings. Okay? So let's, let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you that you are a wonderful counselor. Thank you, Jesus, that in the world full of lies and fake news and alternative uh, facts, we can actually look to you and uh, receive truth and good words and good counsel and, and wise teachings. Um, that actually breaks us free from, from these prison walls that we've built up all around us in our heads. I want to pray that actually that happens for some of us today, that some, some, some actually have been in a prison for years. Pray that today will be the day where they will sense that you're breaking them free from that and they can move on. They don't have to be tied to a plastic chair like that horse. I pray that that would happen for someone today. Thank you, Jesus, that your word is a compass. Thank you, Jesus, that your word is an encounter, uh, not just abstract words, but so personal where we can meet with you. And Lord, help us to also make it a habit. But we want to be serious about this. If this is your word, why wouldn't we open this book and, and, and seek you in it and, and seek your counsel and your wisdom? I pray that you will help us to do this because we know that the devil, he's real and he's crafty and he fights nothing harder than our time in your word. And so I pray that you would help us to get consistent, uh, to not feel guilty when maybe we, we didn't read the Bible for a day or a week or a month even, but, like, but that we would always kind of feel uh, drawn back, like a, like a magnet. We feel drawn back to, to come to your word and to receive from you. I want to pray this for our church. Uh, Lord, bless our church. We pray we would always preserve this. pray we would always be a church that is more than anything else, that we are serious about reading your word and following and obeying you. Pray this for us in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen.